For seven months, they've been training for this moment, a dusk departure for a 200-mile trek across cruel country under conditions that would prevail behind enemy lines. That's a lot. This is it, then, isn't it? Combination of the course. How important is this for them? Oh, very important, yeah. For them, it is for me. I hope it goes right. I hope they come up to expectations, I'm sure they will. What can go wrong on this? Well, everything, really. Um, with the weather closing in like it is now, um, it's not prepared to make the objects, objectives. I'm losing them. Um, that's mainly the, the main thing, is losing them. That's my biggest worry, is to lose them, I suppose. So... Don't lose more nervous than all of me, I don't know. Let's hope it works. Exercise Naughty Finale is a long-range patrol exercise, which is the culmination of ML2 Arctic training phase. It is designed to test the ML2 course on the following subjects. Helicopter insertion, deep penetration patrolling, close target reconnaissance, agent contact drills, communications, mountain movement and safety, the use of caches, agent pipeline routine, observation posts, and limited Arctic survival. The exercise will take place in the area from Grotley, across to Donbass, south of Yerkin through Grimsdalen, down to Ottenbru, and then carrying on down here to Lillehammer, Nordsetter and Shushan. Total distance about 270 kilometers. The Royal Naval Sea King helicopters dumped them in a place so godforsaken that it has no name. Only a grid reference on a military map. It is 100 miles from anywhere and the temperature is a brisk minus 40. They would travel on skis in teams of four. Each man carries almost 100 weight of equipment. It is more now than a mere thesis in survival. It is a fully operational mission in which information, all coded, must continually be fed back to base. Surreptitiously, they're shadowed by the ubiquitous and also mechanised Sergeant McClay. The nearer pylon is their first objective. Interred close by under freshly fallen snow are their first rations for three days. But in country like this, when you've seen one pylon, you've seen them all, and Norway has several hundred thousand of them. By map reference only, they must pin down an area of 20 square feet. Well done. Great. With the weather conditions, as you know what it was. Tell us what it was, you haven't got it well, it is uh, 25 knot winds, temperature minus 20, which um, probably gives them uh, minus 35, 40 temperatures. Complete whiteout conditions, so they've now skied um, 50k.
How crucial is it that they hit these food cases? For them, very crucial. Um, if they don't hit them now, then they're going to be very uncomfortable and lack of um, food for the next three days, which is the next one. So it's crucial that they hit them. They'll have, they'll have emergency rations, um, but you can't live on emergency rations and ski these sort of distances. War conditions are strictly observed. A sentry is posted. Only the avalanche probes can now confirm whether they've found the correct pylon across thousands of square miles of wilderness. Bearing the treasure that brings a whole new meaning to frozen food, they ski on to their next assignment, two full days away. This task requires timing as well as navigation. A rendezvous with an agent, a member of the Norwegian Special Forces, on a lonely bridge. They're to hand over photographs they've taken for use in future sabotage. This is their agent contact um, point. And what's going to happen is that they're going to meet an agent to give them um, orders for them to be put in agent pipeline. They've carried out their task and they've done all their OPs and close target recognition, etc., etc. They'll pass on all that information to this agent. He will then give them another location to, to ski to um, where they'll meet probably another agent and then they'll go on through the pipeline for the next three or four days. To, to be frank, isn't that just a bit James Bondish? No. Um, <clears throat> it, it sounds it and uh, in actual fact that is the way you would operate and we've operated that way before um, for real. We, for them to operate as they are in four-man teams, it's no good me flying a helicopter in here to resupply them. Um, if they would be operating this far forward as the exercise um, is, and they would operate anyway, um, it, they would have to go through a pipeline to get them out of it. The handover is to take place at night, and once again our pictures are by courtesy of image intensifiers. The first Marines group win few marks for an unimaginative contact. They send a man with a rifle, conspicuously a soldier. Cream pizzas for breakfast. Hey. Are all bra? All tuko? Are all bra? All tuko? Medere? 
Half an hour later, an apparent civilian arrives, speaking excellent Norwegian. Hvor skal du? Hvor lang er tiden, Lille Hammer? Og tre, fire dager. Jeg vet sagt sånn før du våknet. Ja, jeg hadde green pieces for breakfast. When I saw this civilian coming towards us, I started on and he asked about the way to Lillehammer. I was a little surprised. He looked like one of the men I know from the area here, so I really thought he was a civilian. He was speaking in Norwegian? He was uh, partly speaking in English, and he, but at last he spoke very good Norwegian, yes. Okay. And I asked the further on in Norwegian if they had problems, and they said yes, they had problems. And it was only two men of them here, and the other were all seven kilometers from here. Did, did you say what the problems were? They, well, yes, they had a problem with the radio, and they had, they had been to a telephone a kiosk and made a telephone call to get a new radio, and I, I had a new radio for him here. But uh, he was speaking very good Norwegian, so it wasn't a problem for me. Uh, how do you know it for me? Have, have yes, you yeah. for me? Yes. That was a that was a pretty good performance, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was a, a textbook performance. He did everything as he should do, and uh, it was more or less perfect. Were you surprised though that he was in civilian clothes? Uh, normally I would until I saw who it was. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, it, 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 he uses a lot of, of initiative, and I think for for an area like this, if I looked at the area and thought there's going to be a lot of people knocking about, and for his approach, also the problems he had earlier on in the day. Um, for him to ski about in uniform and try and get to phones, etc., he's got to get over hold of some civilian clothing. Obviously, he did do. The photographs and sketches the departing Lieutenant Smith has delivered to the agent go back to HQ for analysis. About they contain explicit details of how to blow up an integral part of the Norwegian railroad system, an exercise which happily never goes further than the theoretical stage. And what we discovered was along here. Yards from the edge of the, of the railway line, there was a very sheer cliff going down to a, that, the gorge, <coughs> the same gorge which your bridge goes over, in fact, one section's bridge. And uh, the fir my first thought was, if you could crater that there, you could block the line completely and they'd be stumped. We definitely recommend that the western end is attacked because the eastern end is easier to approach and they can obviously get more equipment to bear to uh, fix the uh, damage. The actual tunnel itself starts off, it's got a concrete surround at the front. Um, it's about seven metres in height, six metres wide. I've got all the dimensions, but just to give you a rough idea. 14 metres into the tunnel is reinforced concrete. It then ends abruptly. There's a recess on each side of about half a metre, a little over half a metre, and then you've got bare rock. So anyone laying charges would probably have to move at least uh, 20 metres into the tunnel to blow it. But that, those two black dots there are the two tunnels, and we actually put our OP in just above them, up here. And as Tom will explain, when they actually did the CTR, they looked back from the station area, and there was no way they could see our position. I don't intend to go into the train times now. They're in, in the actual pack which we handed to the agent. Um, suffice to say, this gives us passenger and goods times, and we also managed to pull a line off a friendly agent, uh, an actual civilian bus, uh, sorry, train timetable, which would naturally, if you're going to blow the tunnel, which Tom will come on to on the CTR, you don't want to do it while there's a civilian train in the vicinity. Okay. I'll now cover the CTR for three section on the actual junction. Uh, we'll show you the viewfall in two parts to orientate you. This here is the road that leads to Donbass. This is the footpath that we keep talking about, and it was... Uh, goes up quite steep ground up back here and eventually joins onto the E6. Ostensibly, their graduation examination is coming to a close. They have 40 miles to go and all four teams have been ordered to link up for the final phase. You don't need it anymore, do you?
Their last rendezvous is with the helicopter they assume is to fly them out to warmth, a bath, fillet steak, a phone call to their wives and sleep. One helicopter, but no Marines. So enthusiastic is their commanding officer John Lear to see them again that he lands before the helicopter. Aren't you annoyed that they're not here? Uh, I'm not annoyed. I'm perhaps a little, a little sorry they didn't make the last six kilometres, but what, six kilometres? You know, they've, they've skied about, I would say, just under 200 or perhaps just over 200 in the last 10 days, which is pretty good going for what they've had to do. And don't forget, they spent two days on an operation as well, doing nothing but sitting still. Do you want them really rock bottom when they come in? No, I want them to still have the ability to go on and do something else when they come in, but I want them to know what their limits are. And I believe that they'll, they'll be close to their limits at the moment. Show us the limits, Tom. They do make it an hour late, hanging on the single acronym that will mean it's over. Index. Ah! Index, Marines speak for end of exercise. But it's not quite that simple to qualify for an elite special forces unit. They're ordered into the helicopter for a reception and a destination they'd never dreamed of. We had an idea that there was something happening. So we uh, arranged that we wouldn't go without a fight. So what we, what we planned on, when, they, when we embarked on the helicopter, was going to leave George and Jan, the big Dutch officer, in the last two seats, so they'd be first out, so they could handle anybody who was there, hopefully handle anybody who was there. And then we was all going to pile out any door we could and have a go at it. At their lowest physical ebb, they've been set up for capture to test whether they'll resist. They do. They're all standing there, and we piled out, and it was, you know, what's going on? And then <laughs> something clicked, and they realised we were running for it. And uh, the ones that didn't get far enough had to stand and fight. And that's when people started getting hurt. And we just escalated from there. I mean... You'd imagine trying to, to hold someone like Big Yan. And they, they did it, but it took six of the buggers to do it. <laughs> uh, and they were using everything. And mm -hmm. so consequently, we reacted in the same way. It, it comes to the law of the jungle, really. Do it to others and all that, but do the bugger first, because otherwise you're going to get hurt. And we all got hurt. All of them, all of us. You know, obviously on a course or whatever, someone's got to be in charge of you. They've got to have the rules and that. But the course spirit is a way of, uh, of actually getting back at them without breaking those rules or going against authority, you know? It's a way of, like, I suppose, hitting back and who's hitting you. Go for it, boys! What occurred in the final 48 hours of their little odyssey was sufficiently unrelaxing to become subject to the Official Secrets Act. But at last, after seven and a half months, it's over. The only remaining strain is the waiting, to learn whether they've failed or passed. If their home base in Plymouth tends to look more like crafts than a military establishment, then it's a timely reminder that, at heart, Royal Marine Commandos are kindly, sentimental men who've been pining for their mascot. Uh, he's still as vicious as ever. We just give him. Yeah. Well, in the best fighting conditions of the service. Yeah. Actually, I think if they train him up properly, you know, the next course could take him. <laughs> and he could be uh, quite a, a benefit. Yeah. See him stalking the rabbits and screaming down from the sky. <sighs> we all find out today exactly, you know, how well or how badly one's done and, uh, you know, whether you're passed or not. Hopefully everyone will have passed. Uh, I mean, you can't really see any reason for uh, anyone to have failed, but uh, like we always keep saying, you know, you never really know. It's up to them, you know, what they decide. And I don't think it really should happen that you should get this far and fail, but it does actually happen, so, I mean, you know, I have to wait and see.
It's worse than waiting for your O-levels. Anyone who's failed will be sent back to his unit immediately. Gun Mills, some H1 check. Shut the door, please. As soon as you had results, those that failed would come straight in and start the living routine. Why didn't you start it? Nobody said anything, sir. I, I heard Sergeant McLean say it this morning on the parade. Those that you had failed, as soon as you come out from your results, go to the Sergeant Major and start your living routine. We haven't had the results yet, sir. Not nothing about it. Oh. Hmm. All right, my apologies. I thought you had the results. OK, right, well, while you're in, you just want to take those away for you. That's your replacement underwear items that should have come about three months ago. Thanks, so much. And they're wet outside. Send Courtney Mills in. Courtney Mills. There's your CTAC ready to go and leave. Yep. Why haven't you been here before? You weren't told anything, sir. I heard Sergeant McLean tell you this morning on the parade. That you were to come here immediately you'd had your result. We haven't had our results yet, sir. Oh. Oh, perhaps I'll jump the gun a bit then. Come on, downstairs again. See me as soon as you come out of the boss's office. Corporals Craig and Mills failed, only to be immediately reinstated. Sergeant Major Shiner Wright will have his little joke. I was put up to that, you two. It's a fight. It's rigged, you did it or what? Your underpants are full. <laughs> <laughs> Adrenaline is brown. I've got brown adrenaline running down my leg. <laughs> right, see you stop, Major, for that. <laughs> I will, sir. Got Mills. Got Clayton. Got Miller. Got Johnson. Got Dix. Got Thompson. Got Grana. Okay, Quick, Mark, there's a the desk. Salute. I'm Craig, stand easy and stand easy. I've got your final course report after the seven and a half months, and I'm going to read it to you. Last couple Craig is a fit, determined junior NCO, a coarse character who always gives his best. He reached an above average climbing standard at the end of the Wales phase. As a novice in the Arctic, he found some of the skiing hard going. However, his outgoing personality and grit enabled him to cope well. A little shabby with his practical demonstrations at times, but produced an above average final one in the snow and ice phase. A likeable man who should be an asset to the branch. Thank you very much. Can I need to send a picture to shake the hand? Right, that's it. Yes, oh, hang on, I want you to sign this bastard. Just sign there. Let's say you've read it. OK, I'll read the bottom bit to you. Sergeant Matthews has passed out of the course of the top student and will receive the Thompson Trophy in recognition. He approached the course with a sensible, mature attitude which was only to be expected of an experienced senior NCO. Sergeant Matthews will do well in whatsoever job he's employed, giving 100% effort at all times. He is awarded a superior pass for the course. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to getting to a unit now and doing the job that I've trained for. It's uh, something I've wanted to do for quite a while. I'm just glad it's all yeah. done. Well, we talked in Norway, you said you would leave it. Or if you failed, then, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I seriously meant it. If I'd have failed the course, um, I've spent the last three years trying to get a career in the court, and this is the career that I chose. And if I'd failed this course, it meant I'd have had to start again, look towards other things and start from scratch, or I'd have got out. But as it is now, I'll probably sign on. George. Right, lads, don't go anywhere yet. I want someone to get the key for the lecture room. We'll all get in there and I want a final word for you before you all 
um, go and have your scan. And you've got the detail for this afternoon. There's one or two words I want to say. Don't amble! Yeah, we've got work for you to do out there. I was going to say let's all thin off down the booze and have a wet, but we'll make that tonight. And when, when all the formalities are finished, then we'll get together and have... The boss doesn't want it to turn into a hoolie, but I'm sure it fucking will. <laughs> <laughs> Just so that you don't disappoint him on, your, on the, the last thing that you do. Don't anybody let me down tonight and you, you're singled out, you'll find out now wherever you go. Um, they'll say, oh yeah, you're, you're the card or whatever course you do, and you get treated that little bit better. And you're expected to be that little bit better, no matter what course you go on, whether it be combat SIGs, whether it be paracourse, um, or up at, on a combat survival or what have you. Well done, all of you. Good set of passes and a good course. Been a pleasure to wear with you. And I'll see you tonight. Let's go. Drink the a fanfare and a police escort for those who've made it. Eight months ago, 26 men set out to become members of the Royal Marines Mountain and Arctic Warfare Carter. 13 fell off rocks or by the wayside. 13 came through. They are men of style. Men of a very special special forces unit. That's nice. Yeah, that's good. We're just one or two. Yeah, we'll run through a few now. That's it.